The following is speculative, and will be oscillating between science and symbolism. The cosmic Ouroboros was initially created by 1979 Nobel Prize winning physicist Sheldon Glashow. It comes in a few flavors, but the general idea starts at the Planck scale of the snake's tail with the GUT, or Grand Unified Theory, a class of models that attempt to merge the three gauge interactions of the standard model, electromagnetic, weak, and strong forces into one single force. Working our way along the serpent, increasing by powers of five, we see elementary particles, atoms, us humans, Nihau, all the way up to galaxies, superclusters, and finally the head, the entirety of the observable universe. There's a lot to unpack here. The intro visual likely reminded you of the classic 1977 short, Powers of Ten, by Charles and Ray Eames for IBM. Starting on the Chicago lakeside, a daring camera operator travels to the outer edge of the universe, then shrinks to a skin cell in a guy's hand, all the way down to the subatomic level. As the Ouroboros overlaid version plays, a few callouts. One, please subscribe to this channel, I'd really appreciate it. Two, chapters are located below. And three, references in this video are linked in the description, if you wish to watch or read further. Okay, so anyone who watches Powers of Ten or its derivatives probably has a similar thought. The smallest and largest scales seem connected. The Simpsons parodied this with one of the best couch gags ever. So good they used it for three episodes. As far as I know though, they're the only ones with the audacity to loop it around. The edge of the universe folds full circle back to Homer's head. Wow. It always comes back to the Simpsons. Oh, look, here comes Lumpy, the school snake. Help, help. Oh, Lord. Now, before we dive into the physics, first, let's touch on the history of the symbol itself. The Ouroboros is my favorite mythological symbol. That's probably obvious, given this channel's crest. The oldest depiction of the Ouroboros was found on pottery from the Yangshao people in China as early as 5000 BC. The Ouroboros represents several concepts, including one, eternal cycle, two, self-sufficiency, and three, unity of all things. For ancient Egyptians, it symbolized the formless chaos that envelops the structured world and plays a role in its cyclic rejuvenation. It embodies the concept of disorder coexisting with order, highlighting the eternal cycle of renewal that maintains the balance of the universe. The Ouroboros serves as a reminder of the interconnectedness of opposing forces, and the perpetual process of creation and destruction inherent in Egyptian cosmology. In Norse mythology, the Ouroboros takes the form of Jormungandr, a sea serpent who grows to such immense size that it can encircle the earth, i.e. Midgard, grasping its own tail in its jaws. When Jormungandr releases its tail, this will trigger Ragnarok, the ultimate battle signaling the end of the world. The symbol is prevalent in Gnostic and alchemical texts throughout history, and the term itself comes from the ancient Greeks. Oru means tail, and boros, eating. In most depictions, it's consuming its own tail, and the universe is a self-devouring paradox. In others, it's chasing its tail, and the cosmos is self-actualizing. The head yearns for the tail that nourishes it, just out of reach. Quoting every mystic's favorite psychologist, Carl Jung, the Ouroboros is a dramatic symbol for the integration and assimilation of the opposite, i.e. of the shadow. This feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality, since it is said of the Ouroboros that he slays himself and brings himself to life, fertilizes himself, and gives birth to himself. Though visually absent in most versions, the Ouroboros symbolizes reincarnation through the shedding of its own skin. Like a phoenix, it rises from the ashes. This skin shedding symbolizes the transmigration of souls, representing the concept of reincarnation or the journey of the soul from one life to another. Presumably, this molted skin comprises the very environment in which it resides. Back to the cosmic Ouroboros. 
Nobel laureate Sheldon Glashow noted the micro and macro connections between fields across different scales of the structure. In physics, four fundamental forces govern nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force. At the largest scales we're familiar with, gravity exerts the greatest influence, shaping the universe as we perceive it. Around our human scale, gravity remains prevalent, but we begin to recognize the prominence of the other forces. And as we delve into the realm of atoms and smaller particles, gravity becomes negligible, and the other forces take precedence. During the 20th century, physicists uncovered the nature of these three non-gravity forces at the atomic scale, revealing the fundamental particles that compose all matter. They developed theoretical frameworks to understand the interactions of these particles down to distances approximately one one-thousandth the size of atomic nuclei, our current limit of comprehension of the infinitesimally small. At even smaller scales, such as the Planck scale, it's expected that gravity will regain its dominance. From the primary source of this video, the view from the center of the universe by Nancy Abrams and Joel Primack, everything in the universe is significant on some scales, insignificant on others. The cosmic serpent swallowing its tail represents the possibility that gravity links the largest and the smallest sizes and thereby unifies the universe. This actually happens in superstring theory, a mathematically beautiful idea which is our best hope for a theory that could unify quantum theory and relativity. In string theory, sizes smaller than the Planck length get remapped into sizes larger than the Planck length. Another interpretation may seem peculiar at first. It suggests that the act of swallowing might have preceded the serpent itself. According to our current understanding of the laws of physics, at the beginning of the Big Bang, only the head of the cosmic Ouroboros existed with the tip of the tail in its mouth. The cosmic scale was minimal as there was little distinction between the smallest and largest sizes. The smallest scale was determined by the constants of nature, and the largest scale, the cosmic horizon size, was only slightly larger because the universe was young and had not yet expanded significantly. Over time, as the universe grew and evolved, the body of the serpent filled in. Thus, the swallowing of the tail represents a fundamental aspect of the expanding universe's evolution. This notion evokes the concept of it from bit, set forth by legendary physicist John Wheeler. He proposed that all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and that this is a participatory universe. The eye in his famous diagram symbolizes the active role of the observer in acquiring information and shaping our understanding of reality. For example, we can affect the trajectory of light from a distant star in the past by how our telescopes view it today. By observing and interacting with the world, we actively participate in the creation of the information that underlies the universe. Let's follow up with the three non-gravitational forces in a bit. Next, let's turn back to the serpent symbol. There's a rich history of serpents throughout religious and mythological narratives. You'd be hard-pressed to find a tradition that didn't include snakes, quite frankly. From several sources in the book The Cosmic Serpent, a snake is merely the zoological entity, but serpent, as we will see, opens up vast metaphorical possibilities. There's the Nagas of Hindu mythology. The Hindu god Vishnu sleeps on the coils of Ananta, the serpent of infinity. In Dahomey in West Africa, the creative force controlling all life and motion is Da, meaning serpent. There's a harrowing tradition in Burma, now Myanmar, of a priestess who has to kiss a cobra, a madraya, three times in order to save her village. His venom is so powerful that the equivalent of one bite could kill more than a hundred men. By the end of the ceremony, her dress was covered with venom. We never found out if any male children were born thanks to the cobra's kiss. 
Serpents are critical in the Christian Bible, of course, most notoriously tempting Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in many of the oldest creation stories, not only of Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, but of the Americas, there is a goddess mother in the form of a serpent. According to research published in 1973 by Michael Harner, shamans under the influence of ayahuasca see snakes apparently at least as often as any other single class of beings. They can be found in creation myths and as guardians of the underworld. They represent immortality, wisdom, and healing. So the serpent may be the most widespread mythological symbol in all of human history. Which begs the question, why? A leading rationale is snake detection theory, which posits that primates and snakes co-evolved, and snakes specifically drove the evolution of the primate visual system. For millions of years, snakes may have been the only significant predators for our ancestral primates. Anthropologist Lynn Isbell makes this argument in her 2009 book, The Fruit, the Tree, and the Serpent. There's some supporting evidence for this hypothesis, including brain imaging and EEG studies. So perhaps the vaulted status of the snake is a vestige from biological evolution. You see those fangs? You get bit by those, you're gonna die. You're gonna wanna die. Let's pick things back up with, after gravity, the other three fundamental forces in physics. Electromagnetism dominates at the bottom scale, influencing phenomena ranging from atoms to mountains. The strong force binds atomic nuclei, and the weak force is involved in certain radioactive decays. The strong and weak forces not only prevail at the nuclear scales on the left, but, along with electromagnetism, govern energy generation in stars on the right, impacting planetary compositions. A sun produces light through the conversion of two protons to two neutrons, a weak interaction, and their fusion, a strong interaction, to create a helium nucleus. The electromagnetic force is carried by the photon. W and Z bosons are responsible for the weak force, and the strong force has eight mediating bosons called gluons. The same laws apply at all scales, but they vary in importance based on where you're located on the cosmic Ouroboros. Your reference frame matters. Beyond these forces, composing about 85% of the matter in the universe, there's mysterious dark matter, which exerts gravitational dominance on galactic and larger scales, potentially relating to the physics of even smaller scales. But dark matter is not associated with any of the forces that we know and understand on the scales we have probed so far, so we assume that it must be associated with laws of physics on still smaller scales, possibly from supersymmetry, that's S-U-S-Y, or other ideas such as Pechi Quinn's axions. Mysteries abound, which lead us to a recent growing interest of mine, Kundalini Yoga. The concept of Kundalini energy dates back to Vedic texts from 1000 BC. For those unacquainted, the basic idea, stay with me now, is that there's a divine feminine energy in the form of a coiled serpent located at the base of the human spine. <laughs> Practicing certain techniques, including a pranayama breath practice and bodily movements, think lots of body twisting, can possibly open up chakras, leading to spiritual liberation and powerful awakenings. If esotericism isn't your jam, that's totally okay. But over the past few years, for me at least, Kundalini keeps popping up. Carl Jung was fascinated by Kundalini, and Sanu Shamdasani edited together Jung's lectures and discussions on the topic in The Psychology of Kundalini Yoga. Jung claimed, the Kundalini Serpent is a chain of glittering lights, the world bewilderer. By creating confusion, she produces the world of consciousness, the veil of Maya. I've recently started a regular Kundalini practice and will report on my experiences. Finally, in our last chapter, let's leave outer space and land this rocket ship. String theory is one of the leading candidates for a theory of everything. It proposes that all elementary particles are manifestations of vibrations in tiny looped strings. Each particle corresponds to a unique vibrational pattern of the string. The electron, for instance, represents the lowest mass vibration with electric charge. 
Loop quantum gravity is another theoretical framework that seeks to reconcile general relativity and quantum mechanics. It postulates that space-time is composed of tiny discrete loops, forming a granular structure. Space and time are not continuous, but rather quantized entities. So our best candidates for explaining reality are strange loops. The smallest unit of our cosmos, the Planck scale, beyond which space and time have no meaning, is roughly 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The size of the universe is difficult to measure, of course, but is approximately 10 to the 30 centimeters, and expanding at an accelerating rate. You may have noticed that we humans are located almost exactly between the extreme boundaries of our knowledge. So what's our place within the cosmic Ouroboros? We awaken mid-journey, within the belly of the beast. Perhaps it should come as no surprise that any observer will frame themselves near the center of their perceptual limits. In the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds of cosmic inflation, our universe expanded exponentially from about the Planck length to the size of a newborn baby. Then a phase transition occurred, the rate of expansion slowed down, and our universe grew by the same amount in powers of 10 in the 13.7 billion years since then. We currently reside near the halfway point of our planet's existence. Roughly 4.5 billion years ago, our planet came into being. We have approximately 6 billion more years before our sun expands into a red giant and destroys us. Complex life emerged approximately half a billion years ago and has another half a billion years until solar radiation poses a threat to the Earth's habitability. We are almost the same age. We're meeting in the middle. It's worth repeating that the serpent is likely the most pervasive mythological symbol throughout all of human history. Start looking and so many potential Ouroboric connections strike you. There's Joseph Campbell's cyclic hero's journey, the monomyth held by cultural and religious narratives around the world, departure, initiation, return, and Teilhard de Chardin's Omega Point, an event where the universe spirals toward a final point of unification, where head meets tail. Although the exact origin of the Ouroboros symbol is unknown, it's well documented that snakes, on rare occasions, do bite their own tails. Herpetologists speculate that this behavior may be triggered by stress or when the snake's body temperature is excessively high. Stress is an exported error signal. Minimize surprise and minimize stress. The least surprising thing is yourself. We don't realize that most often we're chasing our own tails. But something funny happens when you finally catch what you're hunting. Prey seized in your maw, you bite down, sink your teeth in, and it hurts. I leave you with a quote from Thomas Pynchon. If patterns of ones and zeros were like patterns of human lives and deaths, if everything about an individual could be represented in a computer record by a long string of ones and zeros, then what kind of creature could be represented by a long string of lives and deaths?